Hello, my name is Katie Pearson. I'm a curator here at the Robert F. Hoover Herbarium at Cal Poly State University. If you don't know what an herbarium is, don't worry, I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you about plants today. Uh, I'm, I really love plants, I'm a botanist as well. And uh, we're gonna talk about how plants are really important for biodiversity. We're gonna talk about how there are some really interesting plants here on the central coast of California. Um, and we're going to talk about how plants are documented in herbaria and how you can help herbaria help biodiversity by uh, volunteering online from the comfort of your home. It's really easy, it's really fun, and we really need the help. So we're really looking forward to talking to you about this today. So let's get started. I probably don't have to tell you this if you're watching, but our California Central Coast is a gorgeous place. You might also be familiar with the fact that it's a pretty biodiverse place as well, home to thousands of species of fauna and flora. One thing you might not realize is that much of this beauty and biodiversity is due to plants. Plants are everywhere and make up a great part of the unique landscapes we enjoy. Scenic coastal drive, lined and scaffolded by plants, rolling inland hills, burgeoning and teeming with plants. Even when we stop to appreciate the region's animal life, you can't avoid also seeing some plants. That's because plants are the foundation for most terrestrial ecosystems. The entire nutrient cycle and thriving of life on Earth depends on plants. Plants play important roles in protecting biodiversity. Their stems and leaves, and sometimes even flowers and roots, are the source of food for herbivores. Those as large as mule deer, and those as small as tiny caterpillars. Other creatures like butterflies, moths, bees, and hummingbirds rely on the flowers for nectar and pollen. Almost all living things depend on plants for providing shelter and stability. Mammals, birds, and reptiles all escape heat, cold, wind, and predators by seeking shelter under and around plants. Plant roots also keep the sandy soil of the central coast together preventing erosion and soil runoff. Many fungi rely on shade, moisture, and detritus from trees to grow and multiply. Oh yes, and of course, plants make oxygen from carbon dioxide, so they're pretty much responsible for everyone breathing. And to humans, plants also offer incredible beauty. What isn't there to love about plants? It's important to remember that plants are not just important for biodiversity, plants are part of the biodiversity. Plants are living creatures like you and me. They don't move quickly or consume other organisms, well, most of them, but they take in nutrients, excrete wastes, grow, and reproduce just like us. Let's take a look at some of the awesome biodiversity here on the central coast of California. We have many characteristic plant species that you've likely seen before and are important constituents of specific habitats. One of the most common habitats on the central coast is called chaparral. Chaparral is a mixture of thick woody shrubs that often have hardened leaves. Some important species found in this habitat are black sage, which has a wonderful minty fragrance, especially if you crush the leaves within your fingers, and cheerful white-purple flowers. And then we have California lilacs, which come in many shapes and sizes with blue to white to sometimes purple racemes of small firework-like flowers. These plant taxa can be found up and down California, but some species are only found in chaparral habitats near San Luis Obispo County, like the Bishop Manzanita, which only occurs in a handful of counties in the state, primarily on the central coast. Notice that the specific epithet of the scientific name, so that's the second word in the species name, even contains the word obispo to note that it's from this region. Several other species are similarly only found in San Luis Obispo County and many in a couple other counties. Like San Luis Obispo sedge and San Luis mariposa lily, both of which can be found in chaparral habitats. Another similar habitat type is called coastal scrub. Coastal scrub is similar to chaparral and includes woody shrubs like sages and the California lilac, but it often contains more soft-stemmed shrubs and subshrubs like coastal golden yarrow and coastal golden bush, which is flowering on the coastal bluffs right now. 
One of my personal favorite habitats is grasslands, which were once dominated by wildflower species, though Europeans brought in non-native grasses that now dominate these areas. Still, in particularly wet springs, you can see a vibrant display of poppies, baby blue eyes, lupins, phacelias, fiddlenecks, and so many more painting the hills in bold colors. We also have a lot of woodland habits, with larger trees and shrubs including the majestic coast live oak and the colorful toyon, or Christmas berry. And these are only a couple of the amazing plants you can see across the central coast. If you're interested in learning more, I recommend this great book by Matt Ritter. There is, however, another way that you can learn a ton about Central Coast plants from the comfort of your own home. That's in our online plant specimen database, CCH2. CCH2 is the plant specimen database for over 50 California herbaria. It contains data for over 3 million specimens, nearly a third of which include high-resolution specimen images. The database is completely online and publicly accessible. You can search, map, and explore these collections across time and space. Even when there are no flowers outside, there are flowers online. But hold up, you might be wondering what I'm talking about. What are herbarium specimens and why do we have three million of them? Well, herbarium specimens are similar to pressed flowers that you might have made at some point in your life, except we keep a much larger portion of the plant and we record detailed information about where and when the plant was collected. Herbarium specimens have been collected, pressed, dried, and curated in natural history collections called herbaria for hundreds of years across the globe. These millions of plant specimens provide critical data about where and when plants occur, what they look like, and how they may be interacting with other creatures. Herbaria are some of the most important resources we have with which we can learn about plants. But let's just not talk about them. Let me show you. I'm standing here in the Robert F. Hoover Herbarium at Cal Poly State University. It was established by Robert F. Hoover, who was a doctor or professor here at Cal Poly. And then it was directed by Dr. Dave Keel. And now it's directed by Dr. Jen Yates right here in San Luis Obispo, California. This collection has over 85,000 herbarium specimens that have been collected for about the past 150 years. All of these specimens have been collected, pressed, dried, and they're, now they're carefully curated in these airtight cabinets. The cabinets are arranged alphabetically according to family and then alphabetically inside those families according to genus and then species. So if I pull out some specimens here, these are of Streptanthus, also known as jewel flower. This folder that I have here is Streptanthus A through I. So I here I have Streptanthus arizonicus, Streptanthus barbatus. Streptanthus is in the mustard family. Here is a lovely specimen of Streptanthus barbatus. That was collected in Siskiyou County, California. And so we have representative specimens of many, many, many of the species that exist in California and also uh, around the world. I also have pulled out a couple of specimens of the species that we've been discussing earlier that are in the different habitats. But first, let me put away these specimens. Herbarium specimens are plants, and plants are bug food. So we have to be really careful about keeping these plants, these specimens, in airtight cases, watching out for bugs, and sometimes freezing specimens to remove any pests that might be eating the bugs. So that's how plants can uh, stay pressed and in good condition for hundreds of years, is we have dedicated curators, students, directors, who are working on preserving these plants for posterity. Let's look at a couple of these specimens that I pulled out. 
So here is a specimen of black sage. So this was an example of that chaparral and sometimes uh, coast scrub habitat. And what's interesting about this specimen in particular is that it was collected in a town called Marina in Monterey County back in 1968. Well, if you look at where this plant was collected and you look at a map of Marina right now, you can see that where it was collected is currently just a bunch of suburbs and businesses. So we know that in 1968, the habitat around there was coastal scrub or chaparral based on this plant uh, having a specimen. So that's important because it helps us document the past and how the past um, has, or how the plants have changed over time. Another specimen I have here is an example of Fritillaria biflora. This is the chocolate lily. It's an inhabitant mostly of grasslands. But the really interesting thing about this specimen is that it was collected in uh, January of 2015. And normally this plant flowers in March and April. So it's unusual to see these flowers here so early in the year. Documenting flowering and fruiting times is an important part of herbarium specimen research. For this specimen, I have another grassland or maybe even disturbed land inhabitant. This is a, a non-native species called goat grass, barbed goat grass. And it was found probably for the first time in 2000 when this plant was collected by Dr. Dave Keel. And it's possible that because of this collection, because this data was collected, uh, we were able to um, look into eradicating this specimen or the species, sorry, from this region. So having documentation of where invasive species have come or non-native species have come um, can help us, one, control the spread of them if possible, if it's not too late, or two, document how those species spread throughout the region and then help us combat a uh, spread of other non-native species if they are detrimental to the region. I also have some other specimens here. Here's an example of that California lilac, or Ceanothus is the genus name. And then I have a specimen of the coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia. You'll notice that I'm not turning them up directly to see you. And the reason for that is because you can think of these plants as um, having a lot of little pieces that can fall off and we wanna keep those intact because they might be important things like flowers or fruits. So we hold them very carefully. Again, we want these to be 200 years old, hopefully. So this is the basic of basics of the herbarium. And you might be wondering why we are having, going to the trouble of collecting a whole plant instead of just taking a picture or uh, you know, just taking some notes. Well, for one thing, cameras did not exist 150 years ago, and they weren't very common even as soon as 60 years ago. So uh, it's not always possible to take pictures. And also, many species are so similar to one another that they can't be distinguished just by pictures. So you have to actually dissect little pieces of specimen um, or the, the plant so that you can tell which species is which. Also, DNA and other chemicals are preserved in this specimen. So it's secondary metabolites or sometimes even the fungi that are associated with the roots or even inside the plant. That can be preserved along with the physical specimen that we're collecting. So data from herbarium specimens can be used for an increasing number of applications. So for example, I did my graduate research studying the flowering and fruiting times of plants, particularly in the southeastern United States, but now I'm focusing in California. And we can look at how those flowering and fruiting times change depending on climate and land use and uh, changes therein. Other scientists are looking at how plant distributions or appearances might be changing with changes in climate, land use, um, human movement, and how plants' relationships to things like herbivores or mutualists might be changing 
And even how the environment itself, like carbon cycling and nitrogen cycling, change over time. So barium specimens and their associated data are the foundation of our understanding of plant biodiversity on Earth, and uh, which we have already talked about, is really important for the biodiversity of all creatures who live on Earth. So that's the Hoover Herbarium. Like I've been saying, there are many herbaria across the state and across the world, and they all contain scores of vital plant data for use in research and education. There's still one major problem that most of these herbaria face, and that's how do we make the data available for all the researchers, educators, land managers, and students who need it? Before the past 20 or so years, people who wanted to view or use specimens would just have to travel to each collection and pull out the physical specimens. This isn't a big deal for, say, a Cal Poly botanist conducting research on black sage in San Luis Obispo County, but for a researcher in San Bernardino who wants to understand where black sage occurs across the whole state, traveling to many other herbaria might not be feasible. Fortunately, there's an easier way. Herbaria across the world are working on digitizing our collections. This means taking a high resolution photograph for all of our specimens and transcribing the data from the herbarium labels into a database. Here at Cal Poly, we and 27 other California herbaria were recently awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation to fund digitization. As a result, we have hundreds of thousands of specimen images in our online database, CCH2, which I showed you a little bit before. However, we still have a big problem on our plate. Although we have thousands of new photos, many of these specimens are still not searchable because the data from the photos has not yet been entered into the database. That's where we need help. We've partnered with a website called Notes from Nature, so we can invite interested people like you to help us with this big undertaking. It's pretty simple to get involved and it's tons of fun to discover plants and where they've been collected for hundreds of years. Here's what you can do. In a browser window, navigate to notesfromnature.org. If you want to keep track of all the work you're going to do and therefore get credit, you might want to register for an account. Then you can sign in and be able to track all the work you're doing. Scroll down to our project. We're here with the poppy. It says capturing California's flowers. Then on this page, you can select any of the expeditions we have open. They're down here with this button, these buttons here. The expeditions are each with one herbarium. So this is Cal State LA, Fresno State, Orange County is UC Irvine. Whatever floats your boat, just select one. And then you'll be given a tutorial. So the first time you transcribe, you'll want to read through this. It'll tell you about herbarium specimens, where the labels are that you're going to be transcribing, and then it gives you more information about what's on the label. This is really important information because there are, there's a lot of data on each specimen. There are also additional tips and tricks. And if you need more help later, you can go back to the tutorial. You can open up the field guide, which has some frequently asked questions. Or whenever you are working on a specific field, you can click need help with the, this task. And it will give you more information about that specific field. So let's take a look. Here we have a specimen from the California State College at LA. So that's Cal State LA. I'm going to move this around so that I can see its label. And then I'm going to zoom in so that I can see the label nice and clearly. All right, so now I need to fill in some information. I'm looking first for the collector of this specimen. That's usually on the bottom, but it can be at the top at times. This one's pretty clear. We have Chester F. Deaver. Now we're looking for the collector number. So collectors of herbarium specimens will often keep a sequence of numbers so that they can keep track of what specimens they collected, when and where. In this case, it looks like Chester Deaver has a specimen number of 5037. 
So that goes in collector number. Again, you can click need some help with this task if you're not sure what the collector number is. Now we select the collection date. So this is when that specimen was collected and this one was collected back in 1954. So I'm going to click on month and select October or I could have just typed in 10 and October would have come up. Now I'm looking for seven, so I can type that as well and hit enter. And then the year, 1954. I can hit enter and then I can hit the tab button to go to the next field. All right, I'm done with this page, so I'm gonna click next. Now I'm looking for the scientific name. So that is the name of that species that's on the sheet. Here we have Myriophyllum exalbescens. You'll also notice that there's some wording after this, and that happens to be the authorship. So a scientific name consists of a genus and a specific epithet, and then often authorship. So that's who originally named the species and published it as a species that exists in the world. Again, there's more information about what makes the authorship in the need some help with this task. So type that up. And now we're looking for an annotation. An annotation is another label or maybe something written on the specimen that indicates that it was named something else later in the lifetime of the specimen. So that means that maybe some other person came along and said, oh, I don't think this is Myriophyllum exalbescens. I think it's something else. I'm going to zoom out just to double check that there aren't any other labels on the specimen. If there was an, an annotation, it would look something like this, or sometimes like this. I don't see one, so I'm going to say no. Then it asks us whether it's a cultivated plant, which is something that was planted purposely by a human being. But I don't see anything that says this was in a garden, or it was cultivated, or an orchard. So I'm going to say no. Now let's move on. Now we enter information about the geographic location. Interestingly, this specimen was collected in Arizona. Arizona is right next to California, so we might even have this species in California as well. So you can either select from the drop down list, or you can start typing. Move down with the arrow keys and press enter. Now I hit tab. There we go. Now I enter the location information, and that's anything that would help us get to where that specimen was collected, as specific as possible. So it looks like the only information that we have about the location is this right here, Kinnikinick Lake, southeast of Flagstaff. You don't have to put the county or the state information because we already put that up here in this geographic location area. So I put that information in the location field. You also notice that this says altitude of 7,000 feet. That would help us get to the location, but we have a specific field for that. So I'm going to put that right here in the elevation and altitude field. Make sure to put the units if they're listed. This little single apostrophe means feet. Then it asks us whether there are coordinates, so latitude or longitude coordinates. That would be uh, you know, 34 point something 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 north, etc. I don't see that here, so I'm going to say nope, no coordinates, and move on. Next, it asks us what habitat information is on this label. Habitat is the information about the environment or even the other plants that are around this specific plant or this collection location. In this case, I don't have a lot of information about where the plant was collected in terms of its habitat. It's next to a lake, I guess, so I'm just going to say lake. You don't want to make anything up, but this does say lake. There are some cases when the habitat and the location information are very similar. So maybe this, this information says it's a high cliff north of a lake. Well, high cliff would help you get to the location, so it should go in location. But it would also tell you about the habitat, so I can put it in habitat as well. 
Next, we ask, what is the collector's description of the plant? And this doesn't always exist. He does give a family and a common name, but that's not really describing this specific plant on the page. If it were, it might say something like flowers purple or tall or 12 inches tall, wide, something like that. I don't see any of that information here, so I'm not going to enter anything in this field. Then there's a field for any other notes. So notice that I haven't put this information or this information into, the, into any of these fields. But I don't need to for these because this is just the plant family, which we can infer from knowing the scientific name. And then the common name is not super important for our records. So I'm going to leave those out of other notes. But if there were any other information, like uh, whether it was rare or common or frequent or infrequent, I would put that in the other notes. It's also important to include whether the specimen was part of a voucher study or a specific uh, research project. You'll notice here that this says determined by CFD. Determined by means the person who identified the plant. We don't really need that information in the other notes, so you can go ahead and ignore that. We also don't need information about the herbarium name. Again, ask for help and we're happy to give it. If you want to ask for more information about a specific specimen or you're unsure about something, you can click Done and Talk and that will take you to a forum where you can talk to other people about whether you entered information correctly. If not, you can just click Done and it will take you to the next specimen. If you've registered and you've signed in, you can go to your home page and look at a list of all the specimens that you've transcribed. It's pretty fun to build up all of your work. Transcribing specimens on Notes from Nature is a community effort, and we would love you to get involved. You can log in and help out at any time, but if you're interested in being a little more social, make sure to join us on October 15th through 18th for We Dig Bio a worldwide online digitization event that will feature online co-working hours, games, information sessions, and prizes. Check out our website and follow us on Twitter for more information. Plants are key members of the community and herbaria help us protect and discover plants in a reproducible and verifiable way. We hope you consider getting involved in our project to help document California plant life and that you learn a little bit along the way as well as have fun. Please contact us if you have any questions and we look forward to seeing you online. Thanks for tuning in.